we're talking about a subject that is really familiar to folks. I'm guessing most folks spend time in their backyard or out in nature really close to them um, observing birds. And so tonight we're going to focus on um, really what is bringing birds to your backyard and, and ways that you can encourage birds to spend more time there um, and make it more friendly for them. Uh, some ways of, of observing birds and recording the birds that you're seeing in their backyard. And we're going to have a couple of ID challenges for folks. Um, one of my, uh, one of my jobs is as a volunteer eBird reviewer. So we're going to talk about eBird later. Um, and I often, uh, see folks, uh, uh, struggling to tease apart some really common birds that look very uh, close to one another. And so we'll, we'll present a couple of those species that uh, can be really tricky for folks um, even in their backyard. Um, and I'll also give you some more resources for that as well. So on the right uh, is an American robin. I'm guessing lots of people have had robins arriving back to their backyard. Uh, and that robin is in a very um, sad looking backyard right there. Um, that is uh, not really a bird friendly habitat. And I'm guessing that it won't have much more than American robins, um, much more than American robins. Um, oh, hold on one moment. There we go much more than American robins um, spending time there. So what we're not going to do is, is really spend a lot of time diving into identifying all the birds that you might find in your backyard, but it's great to have some resources at the ready. So you should, you should really get familiar with the, the common feeder birds that are, are likely to show up in, in a backyard in your area. Um, and also have a resource that's readily available. So I keep um, my, my small Eastern Sibley guide um, right near my, my back porch window so that I can look out into my backyard and see, um, and, and see my bird feeders and see and have my guide right there at the ready. And I also have a, a spare uh, pair of binoculars that I keep right there as well so that when I'm around the house when I'm, you know, maybe uh, cooking in the kitchen, I, you know, see a bird in the backyard, I have binoculars uh, handy, so that way I can, I can uh, get a good look at it. Um, and uh, Project Feeder Watch has some great, you know, quick references to common feeder birds, uh, and uh, um, uh, eBird is also a really great tool for, for seeing what is common uh, near you. So we're going to, we're going to start with uh, a little species ID challenge because I'm going to show some pictures of these species um, throughout the presentation and uh, you'll get a chance to kind of test your knowledge. Um, and this is one that's commonly, conf uh, two species that are commonly confused. Um, and uh, often I get questions about them. So we're talking about the, the reddish finches, uh, house finches and purple finches. So on the left, we have house finches. Um, on the right, we have purple finches. The males have the reddish color and they're on top, and the females are more brown overall, and they're on the bottom. So the house finch, some of the key identification features are a really curved upper bill. So you can see that really well in the bottom left picture with the female house finch, the top of her bill has a real curve to it. Uh, that's opposed to the purple finch, if you look at the bill of the two birds on the right, it has a really straight upper bill. The house finch, and you can see it really well on the male house finch on the top left, has a lot of streaking that goes down his flanks, 
whereas um, a lot of brown streaking. On the right, that male purple finch, you can see has some reddish streaking and a little bit of brown streaking, but it fades out um, when it goes down into the flanks. That male house finch has, a, has some red on its head that extends a little bit down its back and rump and then on its breast as well. You can see that the male purple finch has a lot brighter color to it. And it almost, to me, it looks like it's, it's like a raspberry color. It's kind of almost a little bit purpley, um, the, the color of the male purple finch. And it is a lot more extensive. So going down the flanks and going onto the shoulders as well. Then for the female, the female house finch has a really plain looking face. It's it's just brown. They are very brown looking. Um, the female purple finch has a little bit more of a pattern to her face. She has this light streak um, above her eye that extends uh, down along her face toward the back and one also on the side of her cheek. So she's got a, a little bit more of a pattern to her face. So that's our, our first kind of species um, ID. And you'll see pictures of both uh, purple finches and house finches throughout the presentation, and I'll point out uh, which is which. Um, this is a funny um, picture that I found uh, from a guy, Josh Lincoln, um, and on the right is not uh, a purple finch. It is uh, another uh, species that is uh, sometimes mistaken for purple finches, um, and that's a white wing crossbill. Uh, but on the left is a female purple finch, and you can see she's got that kind of that cream colored uh, streak at the top of her head. We're going to talk about four areas, four, four needs that birds have when they're visit, visiting a backyard. The first is food, um, and we'll talk about the other three in turn. Um, when folks are buying bird food, they're often buying a blend of food uh, that's you know found at most any hardware store. And I would guess that most people don't put a lot of thought into what they're buying. And it can be overwhelming when you're walking down that aisle. There are so many different things that are packaged in so many different ways. What I try and do is really check the ingredient list and look at the ratio of different ingredients that are in that mix. And we're going to talk about those different ingredients so you can get an idea of what you're really shopping for. So on the left, most people are familiar with, with black oil sunflower seed. So black oil sunflower seed is, is really grown for its oil. It has a really high oil uh, content, which means it's super high in fat. Um, which is great for birds, especially in the winter when they need a ton of calories um, to get get through those those cold winter nights. So in the winter time, especially, birds are looking for for really high calorie, high fat um, food. So the um, black oil sunflower seed are are are, are really a great um, food. They're also fairly thin shelled, which means that most um, birds can get through the shell pretty easily. The challenge with black oil sunflower though is that it does leave those shells um, kind of all over your um, all over your your lawn or your yard um, and uh, it, it can be a little bit of a mess to deal with. The other kind of sunflower that a lot of people are familiar with are striped sunflower. They're a little bit more expensive, and that's because they're they're food grade sunflower seeds. So they're they're also sold, um, you know, when you go to, you know, when you buy a, a package of sunflowers to, to eat, uh, you're going to get sunflower seeds. So they're a little bit more expensive because they're, they're made for human consumption. Um, and they also have a thicker shell. So um, some birds are not going to be able to get through that shell, like starlings um, have trouble getting through striped sunflower seed shells. Uh, and they don't quite have the, the calories that the black oil sunflower does. Um, some people like 
safflower seeds, fairly similar to sunflower seeds, um, also really high in, in fat, which is, which is great for birds, high, high calories. Um, but for whatever reason, perhaps the, because they have the, the tough shell around them, uh, squirrels don't really like them. So some folks that have um, challenges with squirrels raiding their bird feeders will prefer to, to use safflower seeds instead of sunflower seeds. Uh, thistle is a really popular seed as well. I'll show you some thistle feeders because it requires a, a specific type of feeder because the seeds are so tiny. And thistle seeds are really popular with finches. Um, one challenge of thistle though is that it's it's highly vulnerable to spoiling. Uh, so you can get um, thistle seed and if it, it gets wet, um, gets moisture in the in the tube, it can spoil the whole the whole batch. So you want to be really careful and check it regularly um, to make sure that it's it's not moldy. And thistle also has a really high fat content. Another thing that you see uh, oftentimes in these bird seed mixes is millet. So um, millet is used because it's pretty inexpensive um, and birds still eat it. Often, you know, the ground feeding birds will enjoy eating millet, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of fat or protein. So when you're talking about really helping birds out in the winter when they, you know, need a ton of calories, um, millet is, is not the best for them. So they are probably not going to eat it if there are other things like sunflower or safflower around. So you'll sometimes in these mixes, um, you know, see the sunflower seeds go first and the millet is kind of left over. Um, peanuts are also really high in protein. Um, they, they can be expensive as well compared to things like sunflower seed. Um, and the other, this is, uh, Sean, let me just jump in really quick. Shelled peanuts, uh, they, because they, they aren't really protected. They can, they can spoil pretty quickly if they get wet. So you're going to want to, be careful um, with peanuts as well. Hey, Zach. Here are some things that you want to avoid when you're looking at a, a, a bird feeding mix. Um, on the left is, is cracked corn. So cracked corn is, is perfectly edible for birds and, and some birds like, like doves will uh, and pigeons will really like cracked corn. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. It's also really popular with squirrels. Um, so squirrels will will be attracted to crack corn. Um, sorghum is a, is one that's often used in these bird seed blends, and uh, a lot of birds won't eat it, don't like it, so it ends up kind of just sitting there uh, and is is likely to mold if it sits there for too long. And you'll sometimes see in the ingredient lists in these bird seeds. You know, things like oats and and wheat and grains, things that you know they're just really fillers. They're not very nutritious for birds. You know, birds are not going to eat them if there's anything else available. Um, so they're they're really really just for weight in the bag. Um, they're they're just a filler. They're they're not um, really valuable for the birds. So here's two examples of bird. Uh, seed mixes. On the right, you can see a mix that has um, it has some black oil sunflower seeds. It's got some millet in it. It's got some cracked corn. It's got some shelled sunflower. So you've got some um, a lot of a lot of that has high protein uh, content for the birds. And on the left, you see a, a feed where you can almost count the number of black oil sunflower seeds in it. And you can also see there's some wheat in there. There's some sorghum in there. There's a lot more cracked corn. So that bird seed on the left is, is mainly fillers and low protein uh, stuff. Uh, so when you're looking at buying bird seed at a hardware store, you know, you can look at a bat at two different bags and see you know, what are you getting? Are you getting something that is high protein and, and that the birds are, are really going to need? Um, or are you getting mostly uh, fillers? So I want to talk about different ways to feed um, the, the different uh, seeds and, and mixes that we were just talking about. Um, 
what I really like are these platform feeders. So what platform feeders do is they provide space for different, um, different birds and different groups of birds. And this is particularly helpful when you have kind of rowdy birds like jays coming in that tend to take over a feeder. Having feeders on different levels, having some feed on the ground, having some feed up higher allows the birds to sort of naturally separate, separate into different feeding areas and kind of cohabitate a little bit better. And this is a, a really cool series of platform feeders that are made out of uh, old uh, wire reels. So these are, are um, reels that most um, utility companies have that uh, wire comes on. And so if you go to you know the local power company, when they use these reels, they'll recycle them maybe a couple times, but eventually they just throw them out or burn them. Uh, and you can go to them. Uh, I've got one in my backyard um, that you know they'll just they'll just give away. So that's um, that's one thing that you can really do to add some extra levels to your bird feeders, um, and you know pretty pretty easily. Here's the one in my backyard that you'll see pictures of. Uh, and it allows birds to be feeding on the ground and then at this mid-level and also on the hanging feeders. And there's a pole that I put right through the middle of that reel. So there are hanging feeders above it so that the, the food from the hanging feeders kind of spills over onto the, the reel um, and then down onto the ground, creating some different levels for birds to feed on. That's a, a, a better picture of the setup in my yard with those kind of different different feeding levels right there um, and that this time of year I, I'm dealing with that problem that you all are familiar uh, with of the all of the shells of the black oil sunflower seed from uh, the previous winter all over the ground I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit um, here's a really cool option too. If you have like a deck railing that's wide enough, you can pretty easily create a platform feeder just by, you know, spreading seed out along that. And here's a group of red poles that are really enjoy feeding on that, that platform. And one thing I also tend to do in my backyard is uh, just scatter some seed around. Uh, a lot of birds, uh, like to feed directly on the ground and scattering seed like this, especially on you know new fallen snow, provides a visual cue for birds that are maybe flying over and might otherwise miss the fact that there's there's food in the backyard. Um, and so I'll, I'll get you know things like um, snow buntings that will come to my yard, um, which is pretty tiny, but you know scattering the seed gives them that clue when they're flying over that that food is there. And sometimes you'll get other birds too with uh, scattered seed on the ground, like, you know, turkeys really uh, prefer to feed right on the ground rather than having to put their heads up in a bird feeder. So tube feeders uh, and other hanging feeders uh, come in different sizes. These are primarily thistle feeders you can get tube feeders that have bigger openings, but the uh, thistle feeders are almost always tube feeders. And they have this really thin holes uh, that just allow the thistle to come out without spilling everywhere. So the birds like finches can reach their beak right in that little hole and pull out the, the thistle uh, seeds. Um, and these, uh, be, like I was saying earlier, the thistle is more susceptible to, to mold, uh, especially if it gets wet. So these will need to be cleaned regularly, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, on the right is a group of pine siskins, and uh, in, on the left, there's a, another group of red poles. Uh, these feeders are built specifically to accommodate finches that um, come in pretty good groups uh, pretty big size group, so you can you know fit eight birds on a on perches um, on some of these feeders. 
And then another style of hanging feeder that's really popular are these mesh feeders. They have a, um, a bit bigger of a capacity and depending on the size of the mesh, you can even fit things like sunflower seeds and, and peanuts in them as well. Uh, and that's another one that I have in my backyard that the, the chickadees really like because they can cling right to the mesh as well and, and feed right on the feeder. Uh, a lot of people uh, use suet as well. I use a lot of suet. Um, and what suet really is, is just a rendered animal fat. So you can buy the cakes in a store. The cakes often have um, bird seed mixed into it and then comes in a little mold. But I make my own suet cakes pretty easily. So I'll, I'll get, you know, um, if there's a, a big uh, dinner will save all the all the grease, the leftover, you know, animal fat, either cooking bacon or something else, um, and save it, and then mix in a uh, bird seed with that when it's you know warm and kind of not quite liquid, but but warm enough to mix the seed in, and then I have um, square molds that I pour that in, and it in the freezer and then you know particularly in the winter time when birds are looking for that super high um, high fat uh, meal I, I'll put those uh, suet cakes right outside um, but you can also just buy chunks of suet um, you know from local stores or a butcher um, and those chunks of suet you you don't have to do anything to them particularly you can just hang them in a in a mesh bag and the, the birds will get right at it um, and like was asked, it is just about hummingbird time. Uh, and if you don't have a hummingbird feeder, you might be surprised um, that there are a lot of hummingbirds around you if you add one. It can, can bring a whole new dimension to your bird feeding. Uh, and it's really simple uh, to, to fill. Just one part sugar to four parts tap water. Um, it's not recommended to put dye in it. Some people, you know, think that adding red dye helps the the hummingbirds find uh, the bird feeder or, or attracts them, and and really they're they're going to find it. Most of these bird feeders, the hummingbird feeders, have red on them, which attracts the birds anyways. Uh, and the dye isn't really good for the hummingbirds. So if you, if you need to make a big batch of this, if you want to make a big batch of the nectar, you can uh, keep it in your fridge for a couple weeks. Um, and what's really important with the nectar is that uh, if it's not all getting eaten in a few days, that you're dumping it out and, and cleaning the feeder on a regular basis. Um, uh, and uh, don't clean your hummingbird feeder with soap and water. Um, the the soap uh, is is not good for the hummingbirds, so they recommend a two to one uh, vinegar mix, where you're you know taking two parts water and one part vinegar, uh, and washing it with that, uh, soaking it a little bit um, in between your your feedings every every few days or so. And then another element that's um, really fun to add is fresh fruit um, or dried fruit and uh, jelly. You can buy sp specific platform feeders um, with, with little uh, sections for jelly for uh, birds like Orioles and Tanagers uh, that really like th these fruit. Um, and uh, this is uh, on the right, uh, Baltimore Oriole that was hanging out even into December. Um, where someone was putting out uh, jelly and fresh fruit for it. A lot of people like mealworms uh, for bluebirds. Bluebirds are really, uh, really a big fan of mealworms. And what mealworms are are just um, beetle larvae. You can buy them in the store um, dried, uh, which the bluebirds like, or you can even raise them yourself. So you can keep, you know, a group of, of live mealworms. Um, and the North American Bluebird Society has really good recommendations and, and, and guides to um, how to keep 
mealworms going at home. Um, but I think, you know, one of the best ways to provide food for birds and encourage them to keep coming back to your yard even year after year is by um, creating, you know, food sources that are, are living in your yard. So things like um, fruiting trees, sumac are actually really good. Robins love to eat sumac and, you know, other birds enjoy sumac, but it also provides a lot of cover for birds. Um, I have an apple tree in my backyard, an old apple tree. And when that is fruiting, um, when that is uh, flowering in the summer, the in the spring, the the flowers really attract insects, which then attract things like um, Tennessee warblers when they're migrating through. So adding something like a, a fruiting tree might um, might increase the diversity of, of birds, um, even in my even just in migration. Uh, things like grapevines and berry bushes are also really um, important. So, you know, if you have, um, a, a, like a trellis is a great example of a, of a way to, to plant grapevines uh, and allow them to grow in a way that provides both food and cover for birds. Um, native wildflowers are really important um, for hummingbirds too. Uh, if you uh, have um, some native wildflowers, you want to make sure that they're they're kind of uh, staged so that they blossom uh, throughout uh, the spring and summer. So finding a variety of different flowers that will kind of have this rotation of blossoming, so that um, the hummingbirds are fed throughout the throughout the season. Uh, sunflower and thistle are both things that you can grow in your yard that is going to provide food for for birds, and then. You know, just your regular old vegetable garden, you know, can can feed birds, both in the insects that vegetable gardens attract, but also things like pumpkin seeds, um, you know, are, are bird friendly as well. So you can grow pumpkins and, and save the seeds at the end of the year um, and, and use those in your bird feeder as well. And then... You know, one thing that can be really exciting when you have bird feeders is setting up a game camera. And you may find that you get all sorts of different things um, visiting your your bird feeder other than just birds. So this is in my, my dad's backyard uh, where he had uh, a, a group of raccoons that were regularly raiding his bird feeders. Uh, and they were they were pretty good at it, um, but folks may find things like flying squirrels. We have two different species of flying squirrels in Vermont, um, and they'll both come to people's bird feeders, um, but they're only coming out at night. So in, unless you're you're staying up to watch, or if you have a game camera, you might be able to to capture the flying squirrels visiting you. And then of course I have to spend a couple minutes talking about these friends. Um, these, uh, black bears, um, are a definite consideration, uh, if you are feeding birds in your backyard. So the concern is that when black bears have access to food in a backyard, they become, um, they become habituated to people. They become used to being around people and then that they're no longer, they're no longer scared of humans. And, and so the, the possibility of an encounter uh, increases. And so Vermont Fish and Wildlife puts out, you know, pretty strict guidelines around bird feeding. You know, those are, those are recommendations. Uh, and I suggest you make your own personal judgment based on those recommendations and also a knowledge of you know, where you live and, and what the risk of bears are near you. If you live in a place that, you know, you've seen bear on your property, uh, you know that they're around, it's probably a good idea to to take down your bird feeders once we hit the bear active season, um, which changes a lot. Um, and that's a, another thing to note is that it we used to be pretty reliable that 
you know, bear were starting to hibernate in, you know, mid, early to mid winter. And, you know, by December, they're hibernating and they're hibernating pretty well, you know, until the snow is melting in, in March. But now there's uh, less and less snow cover and then we're having a lot more warm spells in the winter. So you can have bears up and moving around just about any time of year. So we're, we want to be really cautious um, of, of bears visiting bird feeders. If you, you know, you're probably gonna know if a bear visits your bird feeder. They um, are not very graceful and uh, have a tendency to just destroy um, whatever feeder is there to, to pull it apart to get at the seed. They're really looking for those high, um, high fat, high, high protein things like, like sunflower seeds. And so a way to avoid this is to make sure that you are pulling in your feeders at night, which is when bears are more likely to be out in exploring backyards. Um, but again, uh, think about you know where you are uh, and what your risk of bear um, is. And certainly if you do see a bear in your area um, or you suspect the bear has visited your feeders, it's probably time to stop uh, feeding the birds for a while. And then, you know, I can't, I have to mention this, that um, making, keeping birds safe in your backyard means keeping your cats inside. Uh, and I, I know for some people that, you know, they really want their cats to be able to get out. Um, but there are, there are ways to do that without endangering birds. Um, house cats kill tons of birds every year. So um, things like screened in porches where cats can be outside, um, but, but still separated from birds or making sure that you are, you know, allowing your cat outside, but on a leash um, can certainly uh, help keep birds safe. Um, I, and, you know, talk to your neighbors too. I had to have a conversation with a neighbor whose cat was coming into my yard and visiting my um, bird feeders. So uh, something to just keep an eye out, even if you don't have cats that are outside. And then I want to talk um, about this unfortunate bird and what's going on with it. So um, bird feeders uh, change bird behavior. They are causing birds to come in much closer uh, contact than they normally would. They're causing species that might not otherwise feed together or, or be close to each other uh, to come in really close contact. Um, and they're, they are providing one single spot where um, birds are coming and going so that um, that disease you know, can potentially linger in an area. And so uh, things like this, this is a house finch. You can see that um, really plain brown head, that curved upper bill in this female house finch. Um, she has house finch eye disease um, that's caused by uh, caused by a germ uh, that causes the the eyelids to swell up and and can make them go blind. And this is transmitted at this is one of several um, bird diseases that are transmitted at bird feeders. So you you want to. I'm going to talk in just a second about how to clean your bird feeders. But if you see um, birds that, that are not looking well, that have abnormal growths, um, that, you know, are, are, are acting in bizarre ways, or if you find dead birds, um, a dead bird in or around your feeder, uh, it's probably uh, time to clean your feeders thoroughly uh, and even take them down for a little while. Uh, you can report using eBird and, and some other sites, you can report uh, instances of bird disease um, at your bird feeders. And if you see this happening, if you see a bird that looks diseased um, like this, you want to take your bird feeders down, but also talk to your neighbors. Um, if this bird is coming to your feeder, it's probably going to your neighbor's feeder too. Uh, and you, you want to make sure that it's not infecting other birds as well. And so one of the ways to do that is 
you know, to really make sure your feeders are cleaned regularly. So this means disposing of old bird seed regularly. Like I said, that some of those seeds can get wet and then get moldy um, and can also harbor germs uh, that cause bird disease. So um, regularly you want to really take out all the old feed, discard it, take apart the feeder as much as you can. So if there are uh, pieces and parts that pull off, you want to do that so you can get in between those different sections. You want to first really scrub it with soap and water to get, you know, the bulk of any, you know, leftover oils or, or bits of seed out. And then really soak it and spray with a nine to one uh, bleach solution. And there's a really interesting study where they, um, where they actually applied salmonella to bird feeders and then tried different methods of cleaning them to see uh, how effective they were. And they found that just scrubbing with soap and water still left a, a lot of salmonella on the feeder. And what was effective, the most effective was first scrubbing it to get a lot of the particulate off uh, and then soaking it in the bleach to, to thoroughly kill everything. So that's what I, I recommend is that sort of two-step process, you know, of first uh, scrubbing it really hard with the soap and water and then uh, soaking it or spraying it in bleach. And you want to make sure that you're cleaning the area around and underneath your bird feeders too. Um, that kind of buildup of seed husks can harbor disease as well. So, you know, at the end of winter when the snow melts, it's time to go out and, and clean up all the black oil sunflower shells from the yard um, and make sure you're doing that regularly. Uh, okay, pause for another species ID challenge here. Um, I'm going to take a moment to just check and see um, if we have uh, some, some questions. How do you keep squirrels from eating all the food? They make uh, squirrel-proof bird feeders, which are really, um, really ingenious mechanisms um, because they, uh, they're weighted. Most of the songbirds visiting our bird feeders don't weigh very much. And so um, most of the uh, birds that um, are coming to our feeders don't weigh very much. So uh, what happens is when the, the birds are uh, sitting on it, uh, they can feed through the hole. But once anything with any weight uh, comes onto the feeder, it pulls down a mechanism and they can't access the holes anymore to get the seed out. So that's a really good squirrel deterrent. Some of those work better than others. Harry uh, Woodpecker's cleaning out sunflower seeds and throwing it on the ground. They don't eat it. Um, I don't know why they're not eating uh, sunflower seeds. Um, my woodpeckers seem to be just fine with them, but maybe yours are, are just pickier than mine. Um, aha, maybe the batch of seed was spoiled. That's quite possible that um, bir birds are really sensitive to things like that. They can tell if there's something wrong with the seed and they won't eat it. So it's quite possible that you had um, a bad batch of seed. Um, and if birds stop eating your bird seed, that's probably a, a sign that it's time to, to throw out that batch and, and get some new stuff. Um, and of course, wash your feeders. Uh, so on that note, we're going to go back and do this um, ID challenge. And oh, my time is flying. So we're going to go quickly through the rest. Um, so two woodpeckers that often come to bird feeders. Hairy woodpecker um, on the right. Uh, these are both males. The males have red uh, spots on the back of their head for both of these species. Uh, the females don't. On the right, that hairy woodpecker has a really long bill. Its bill is more than half the width of its head. If you look on the left, that downy woodpecker has a really tiny little bill. It's about a third of the width of the head. So you, you know, it's a, uh, it's sort of. Um, it's not a perfect science. There is some individual variation. 
you know, you can't really get your calipers out and, and check, but um, that's a pretty good um, benchmark, the, the bill length. Uh, hairies are a lot bigger overall than downy woodpeckers. And if you know the size of your suet feeder, so on the right, um, that, you know, the regular size uh, suet feeder, I think is uh, five or six inches. Um, and so a downy woodpecker, you know, will, will just fit on, you know, one of those regular square suet feeders. Um, but the hairy woodpecker is too big and sort of hangs off. It's, you know, head extends up and over the top of the suet feeder uh, and its tail is hanging down underneath. Um, both species have uh, white outer tail feathers. So most of their tail is black, but the two feathers on the outside of their tail are white. In a hairy woodpecker, they are just white. On a downy woodpecker, they are white, but have a series of black spots on them. So you can see that on the picture of the left of the downy woodpecker, the outer tail feathers that are white, but have those few black spots. And then there's some, um, some references to nasal bristles. So the, and that's actually in the name of the, the downy woodpecker is talk, talks about having soft, um, the, the Latin name references like the softer appearing nasal bristles of a downy woodpecker uh, versus um, a hairy woodpecker is supposed to have really stiff uh, nasal bristles. But a lot of that has to do with position and individual variation. Uh, so that's not something I typically use, even though I've seen it in a few different references. Uh, the two big takeaways I would say are, um, oh, and then the, the shoulder comma, if you see the hairy woodpecker on the right, uh, kind of above its, its black wing on its shoulder, it has a kind of um, a half moon comma shape. Uh, and that tends to be more prominent in hairy woodpeckers uh, than downy woodpeckers. And downy woodpeckers, um, it may be faded to the point where you can't even see that, that comma mark uh, on its shoulder. And so the, the tail uh, and the bill length are probably your two best bets for telling uh, these two species apart. All right, uh, moving on. So after food, uh, water is a, a really um, essential uh, part um, of your backyard for birds. So uh, most people have bird feeders, but a lot fewer people have water elements in their yard. And birds really need water. This, this poor house finch, you can tell it's a house finch with that red head and the really streaky um, sides. Um, this house, house finch is really desperate for water and is, is trying to get it out of the spigot. Uh, and water is really not a, a challenging uh, element to bring into your backyard most of the year. Um, it, it can be just a, a simply a big dish or a tub that you put out near the, the bird feeders um, filled with water. Just like your bird feeders, you want to change it um, and clean it regularly uh, to make sure that you aren't getting disease in there. Uh, these features are really important both for birds uh, to drink and also to, to be able to clean their feathers and, and preen and bathe. Uh, so you can get a wide variety of birds using these all the way from you know, little chickadees to jays um, to cooper socks. Um, so that's a really important feature. Uh, some folks use heated bird baths, which are really cool that um, can help birds stay in your backyard year round. And so when you where the next aspect is really shelter is talking about how we create uh, this uh, a habitat in our backyard and birds are really uh, thrive in an area that have different cover types uh, and different levels um, of vegetation where they can feed safely where they can roost overnight where they can um, they can fly to avoid predators. And so in this yard, you can see there is some ground cover, including native plants um, that may uh, provide some food or nectar for hummingbirds. There's a, a, a really nice trellis that has kind of a mid-level. And also that trellis uh, that has all the vegetation on it is in line with the bird feeders. 
so that birds can use that as a staging area to go to the feeders and escape quickly if there is a predator. In the backyard, in the background, you have a, a big tree, so some canopy as well that's providing some shade, also some roosting place um, for birds as well. It doesn't take a lot of work to add just a simple element um, of shelter to your backyard. So doing something like uh, taking some, some brush and creating a small brush pile or just a small pile of, of branches and sticks near the bird feeders can give them a place to go. Uh, some birds like chickadees will often take um, a sunflower seed off to a perch um, in order to open and eat the seed. So um, providing you know, those kind of uh, sheltering places for the birds to, to safely eat their food um, are really important. Uh, and um, another really cool thing you can do is um, use like old Christmas trees work really well. There's a lot of shelter in, in those you know, small conifers. So putting your, your you know, a, a, an old Christmas tree out near the feeders um, is another place that birds can use for shelter. And that's a really important element that's pretty easy to add, even if it's just a small brush pile. You know, I'm lucky to have a, a pretty good sized conifer in my backyard um, that's a little bit further than the, my bird feeders. Um, and then right behind the bird feeders, there's a lilac bush. So there's this sort of progression that happens where oftentimes the birds will hang out in the conifer when they're ready to feed they'll fly over to the lilac, they'll hang out in the, in the, kind of in the, in the shrubs for a, um, a minute, and then they'll fly to the feeder, take some seed back to the lilac um, and eat it there. And then if they're, they're um, scared by a, a potential predator, if, if they're concerned, they'll, they'll fly back to the conifer for shelter. Um, and, and really creating these different levels um, looks like having some, some big overstory trees um, or even some smaller understory trees. So, you know, at least something that can provide some shade and shelter um, and some, some big perches, as well as some lower shrubs uh, and some ground cover as well. You know, one of the simplest things you can do to really improve the habitat is in your backyard is simply let your lawn grow um, and not mow it. Um, and this also, you know, means not, not just providing shelter for um, songbirds that are going to your feeders, but providing um, places for things like, you know, small hawks and owls to hunt um, and, and control rodents. You know, some people get uh, worried about having predators in their backyard, but I always welcome the, the Cooper's hawks and I wish them good luck as they chase, chase after my squirrels. Um, so the, the last element that you can really add to your backyard to, to increase the bird life are, are places for birds to nest. Uh, and a lot of the birds that you may find nesting in your backyard are using bird houses that are meant to replicate um, cavities that are found in dead trees. So a lot of birds are primary cavity nesters like this chickadee and nuthatch where they're building their, usually building their own cavity um, in a dead tree. And then there are also secondary cavity nesters, uh, birds like tree swallows that are, are, in, uh, that are using a hole that um, has been created by a different bird. Um, but there's a whole suite of species that will nest in a nest box. Um, and they're, they're really easy to make. They're inexpensive, you know, it, it's, um, you know, just a little bit of pine boards can, can make a, a sturdy nest box. Um, and it's a really fun thing to do with kids. Um, there are some great designs um, on, on a website I'm going to share with you in just a, a few minutes. Um, and there's a, there's a wide variety of birds that will use these nest boxes um, or bird houses, um, including wrens and bluebirds, Great crested flycatchers, which is a, a, a bird of you know big open woods in Vermont, um, will actually nest in nest boxes. Um, things like chickadees, 
uh, swallows and even you know owls will nest in nest boxes. Um, and there are all sorts of cool different designs. Here on the on the right is um, a paint can um, tree swallow um, tree swallow uh, nest box. So you know you can be creative uh, in in adapting uh, homes for birds. Uh, and then in addition to nest boxes, there are a lot of birds that you can provide a substrate for. So building things like shelves and platforms <coughs> um, allows space for robins, uh, phoebes, barn swallows, birds that um, are building their own nest but need that kind of foundation uh, to build it on top of. Uh, the photo on the left was just shared um, with me by a teacher. Uh, a colleague who's who's building a house, and in the middle of the building process, uh, a robin started building a nest and laid eggs um, underneath what is going to be the eaves of the house. So they kind of paused construction while they figured out what to do with this uh, new robin nest. Um, and then on the right is uh, an eastern phoebe nest that nests every year on my my dad's porch. Um, and it's, uh, 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 you can track the nest. It's a lot of fun to have a bird nesting in your yard because you can really track the progress of it. Uh, and you know, we use this little, uh, flexible mirror, uh, to keep track of how many eggs are, are happening each year and in each brood. Um, one that I, I, uh, see regularly too are these, uh, Martin houses, so uh, purple martins are, um, are a bird that are often associated with water. Uh, and so in Vermont, they're primarily found along Lake Champlain. So places like Addison County, um, Chittenden County, Grand Isle County, which is completely surrounded by water. Um, that's really where you're finding um, purple martins. And they nest in colonies. So these big houses um, are really what they need in order to, to nest. Um, unfortunately, if you um, are not immediately adjacent to Lake Champlain, you are not very likely to have purple martins nesting near you. And I will see these purple martin um, houses in places like central Vermont and, and Lamoille or Washington County. And there really aren't any Martins there so that the house isn't gonna get used by them, but what will use them are birds like house sparrows and European starlings, which are both invasive species. And so in, instead of you know helping purple Martins um, in those areas, they're actually facilitating breeding of an invasive species. Uh, so, it's a good idea before you just start, you know, put, putting a certain kind of nest box up that you want to check and make sure that that, you know, the species that are using that nest box are going to be in your area. Um, and that, you know, there are some invasive species like house sparrows and starlings that may use um, boxes that are put up for another purpose. Uh, and if you find that there are house sparrows starting to build the nest, it is perfectly okay to clean that out. Um, because we don't need to, to breed any more house sparrows or starlings. They are doing just fine. Um, and, oh my goodness, we're already at six o'clock. So I'll, I'll speed through this uh, last part of just talking about developing a, a practice of, of observing birds in your backyard. So we really uh, have a, a, an amazing opportunity to connect in a deeper way with the birds that are visiting us um, on a regular basis. And so I would encourage a practice like a sit spot where you go on a regular, um, uh, at a regular interval, maybe uh, it's for 10 minutes in the morning or a, a few minutes at night and spend some time just quietly observing um, what's going on in your backyard, who's visiting, what sounds are they making, where are they going? Um, and you may find some really uh, fascinating patterns in this. You may make some amazing discoveries or, or see some really cool behaviors like, you know, 
different species chasing each other around your bird feeders. So it's a really uh, great opportunity to observe birds closely and get to know them um, on a much deeper level than when you just have a chance encounter um, with a bird at a park or out in the woods somewhere. Uh, and the tool that I use for tracking my yard list, and it's a really great tool, is eBird. Uh, you can create uh, your own, you know, personal location for your yard and track what's coming. And what's great about having a backyard where you are birding regularly is you can um, create some consistent data. You can uh, know year after year when the song sparrows are coming back or when uh, the tree sparrows are leaving. Uh, and being able to have uh, data uh, in consecutive years from the same exact place uh, is really helpful in showing uh, the effects of things like climate change. So are some birds lingering longer in a certain area? Um, are some birds uh, returning sooner? I'm sure some of you folks have already noticed changes in, in decade, you know, in uh, the past couple decades um, at your homes uh, of birds changing their patterns. Uh, and when we uh, are making those um, really close observations uh, and we're submitting that data on a regular basis using a tool like eBird, uh, it has a lot of value. Um, that link down below I'm going to share in the uh, chat at the end. Uh, Nathaniel Sharp from Vermont Center for Eco Studies did a, a fantastic uh, presentation this morning about specifically about using eBird when you're documenting birds in your backyard. So, um, you know, I recommend going on and, and watching that if you didn't get a chance to join him this morning. And that will, you know, he talks a lot about specifically how to use the eBird tool um, when you're when you're backyard birding. Um, a couple projects that are, are really great um, to use for your backyard. Project Feeder Watch um, goes throughout our winter, uh, November through April, and it's surveying um, birds that are, that are coming to bird feeders. And you know because it's done uh, on a consistent basis in a, in a very specific place, it's able to, to track those long-term changes that I was talking about. So that's a really fun one to do if you have bird feeders in your backyard uh, to keep track of what's going on. And then if you are putting up nest boxes um, or just have birds nesting in your backyard, uh, Cornell also runs Nest Watch where you can track what's going on with um, your backyard birds that are nesting um, and submit really valuable data uh, to them. Uh, and you never know what's going to show up in your own backyard. Uh, there are some really fantastic and unusual birds that come through Vermont. And if you are paying close attention uh, to your feeders, you may end up seeing something like this yellow-headed blackbird that is a, a Midwest and Western species that uh, showed up at some, some bird feeders in North Hero. Uh, so keep an eye out because you, you may be surprised what's uh, coming to your backyard. Uh, oh, and, and a couple uh, resources for folks to go and, and dive deeper into um, uh, exploring bird life in your own backyard. The Backyard Bird Lover's Guide uh, it goes w into way more detail about um, how to attract birds using different kinds of bird feeders, uh, building, uh, has, you know, diagrams for building nest boxes. Uh, that's a really great resource. Um, Suburbia. Uh, is, a, is a really beautiful book that uh, talks about how we design our neighborhoods uh, for um, birds and other wildlife. Uh, and it's a, it's a really great read um, with some really cool resources. And then uh, Nature's Best Hope uh, is more of a, a read than a reference, um, but talking about, you know, the, the value of uh, starting conservation in our own backyard. So, you know, oftentimes we talk about conservation as something that happens out in wild places um, when really there's a lot of value to conservation efforts that you can do in your own backyard. Um, and that's a, a really great book for that. 
Um, and so on that note, I will take some questions and um, give you a couple resources in the chat. Um, yeah, got to run in a, so I'm going to uh, scroll through here um, and look for some, look for some uh, questions here. Uh, I see if someone is asking about uh, or, or noticed a wren using a purple martin nest. So wrens are not very picky. I've seen house wrens uh, even nesting uh, in people's mailboxes. So you know, there's uh, there's uh, a, a great one where there was um, an old. Um, uh, an old paper receptacle underneath the mailbox and they hadn't gotten the paper delivered for a, a long time. And so the rents had just made a nest back there. Um, so if you, if you do have one of those purple Martin uh, colony houses up there, uh, you'll want to make sure that um, you're not getting any invasive species nesting in there. You may get things like wrens and that's great. But if you're noticing that there are house sparrows um, or starlings uh, nesting there, um, you'll want to, to remove their nests or even take that box down. Um, if folks have other questions, feel free to ask them in the, in the chat or um, unmute yourself and just yell it out. Um, I also want to plug uh, another um, presentation coming up at the Nature Center. Um, that is another ID challenge that's frequently encountered in people's backyards. It's um, uh, a live, another live online uh, presentation with North Branch Nature Center, uh, Solving Sparrows with Brian Pfeiffer. So Brian Pfeiffer is going to talk a lot about um, picking apart those really um, similar looking sparrows that are often coming through, um, coming through people's backyards. Um, Sean is asking about how feeders impact local bird population survival. So um, bird feeders, uh, like I, I mentioned earlier, really do affect, um, affect uh, bird behavior. And so birds like chickadees are able to remember the locations of do like a dozen or more bird feeders and are able uh, to move from different feeders uh, throughout the winter uh, and, and keep track of them. And so some birds that may not um, have enough food to get through the winter if they were just foraging in nature, um, like black-capped chickadees, are able to make it through um, with the help of bird feeders. Um, so yeah, it definitely uh, for some species has a, has a big impact um, on their on their population. Uh, a pileated at ground level on a hemlock. Um, pileateds uh, do lots of pileateds have a really varied diet. So pileated woodpeckers are are well known for making those huge gashes in the sides of trees where they're chasing after grubs, but they'll also um, eat berries, they'll visit bird feeders and, and eat suet, um, they'll do some anting on the ground like northern flickers are known for where they'll get down on the ground and eat, eat bugs right off the ground. Um, so, you know, pileateds, while we think of them, you know, making those big gashes in trees to go after um, insect larvae, they'll eat lots of different things. Um, someone asked, the difference between a goldfinch and a warbler. So uh, finches are a, a group of birds we have in Vermont that are primarily adapted for eating seeds. Uh, and so those are things like house finches, purple finches, and our goldfinch um, that is uh, really bright yellow during the breeding season and a, and a kind of darker tan gold um, later in the year. And 
you can see on the finch bills that they have the really triangular bill that is strong and sturdy and made for cracking open seeds. Uh, the group of birds that we call warblers, our wood warblers in North America, have really thin bills that are adapted for eating bugs. And that's why in the wintertime, our warblers are all moving south. They're all migrating um, to warmer places where they can find bugs throughout the winter. Whereas goldfinches that are able to find seeds um, and crack them open with their bill are sticking around um, into the winter. Do folks have some other questions? I'm gonna scroll back through and see if I missed some questions. Yeah, the weight re responsive feeders, those squirrel proof feeders um, can vary quite a bit. I've seen some designs work really well and other designs that are fooled pretty easily by squirrels. Um, you know, squirrels are, are uh, really agile and I've seen where squirrels are able to jump on top of the feeder and hang down from wherever that, um, that, bird, that squirrel proof feeder is um, hanging. And if they can hang upside down from that point, they don't trigger the mechanism. And so they can still get the, the seed out. Um, and often we'll just scatter a bunch of seed on the ground and then go grab it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, you may, if you're finding that your weight responsive uh, feeder isn't working, um, you may have to hang it um, differently uh, or uh, try a different model. Some work. Um, better than others. Uh, talking about, uh, Rita is asking about what looks like a female sparrow and could be a third year male juvenile. I'm wondering what um, species um, of sparrow that you're talking about. Um, definitely uh, some males um, in some species, the males uh, the juvenile males end up looking, uh, look more like females um, than they do the adult males. It, it may take them uh, a year or two to, to molt into their, that bright adult um, male plumage. Oh uh, yeah, finches, yep. So uh, definitely some, some finches, uh, the, the juvenile males can end up looking like, uh, like females until they they molt into that nice adult plumage. Any other questions from folks? All right, well, uh, thank you all so very much for joining. Uh, and, uh, oh, so uh, Reed is asking about how do we report on eBird Rita, if you're able to scroll up into the chat a little bit, you'll see a link to um, Google Drive. And that is the presentation uh, done by Nathaniel Sharp earlier today um, with Vermont Center for Eco Studies that talks all about uh, using eBird. Um, and Vermont Center for Eco Studies has some great resources um, on how to get started using eBird. Um, as a, as a tool for keeping track of the birds in your backyard. All right, thank you folks so much and I hope to see you all soon at another presentation. Take care.